Hello, good morning. Welcome everyone to the sixth ALDA talk uh, about best practices in the past participatory process. Uh, we will give a few examples of best practices to develop uh, civic empowerment, participation and uh, effective uh, solution. Together with us today, we have uh, Sofia Corsi, Fundraising and External Relations Manager at ALDA. Uh, there, will, there is also uh, Gloria Marini, Project Manager, Press Officer and Coordinator at La Piccionaia, a theatre production centre in Italy. Uh, Ivana Velkova, Project Manager at Alba's office in Skopje, North Macedonia. Alessandra Dal Pozzolo, uh, Project Development Officer at Studio Progetto Società Cooperativa Sociale Italy. And uh, Anna Ditta, Project Development Officer at uh, Alda. And um, uh, we will present uh, different uh, projects, different best practices from this different project, starting from a local level with the Shintila project, uh, which is um, uh, a project that aims at developing new tool for the reevaluation of uh, Viale Milano, a not very popular area of uh, Vicenza. And then uh, Gloria Marini will present uh, the, back, the best practices of the SMART project, uh, who is a project that promotes the culture of accessibility amongst the tourism and cultural uh, operators. Ivana Velkova will uh, describe uh, best, the best practices of the Monumental Nine project, uh, who um, aims at creating the tourism uh, development uh, to increase youth employment, uh, but also uh, income generating activities. And uh, finally, Alessandra Dal Pozzolo will uh, uh, talk about the From Me to You project uh, that aims at providing uh, new uh, opportunities for EU citizens and migrants uh, uh, to um, collaborate and work together. At the end of the presentation, uh, our colleagues, uh, our colleague Anna Ditta, uh, will describe the best uh, funding opportunities for implementing the participatory process. And uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, we will give the floor uh, to the participants. So you will have to ch the chance to um, to speak directly and ask your question. Uh, enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much for the attention. And uh, I will uh, um, give the floor to Sofia Corsi to describe the Shintila project. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Thank you, Eva, and thank you to all my colleagues that will speak after me. I'm very happy to present you uh, a local example and best practice of a participatory process that uh, we implemented throughout the last year, the last 12 months in Vicenza, in the northeast of Italy, uh, a very quite medium-sized uh, small city of about uh, 150 thousand inhabitants um, where uh, we actually uh, started this process uh, uh, involving local communities to imagine a possible uh, future for a neighborhood of the area that is uh, affected uh, by several uh, problems. So actually, um, we decided to work in a specific uh, neighborhood of the city that is uh, affected by highly it's uh, uh, by problems of social integrations. There is a high presence of migrants and people from different ethnicity living together in the same space that uh, uh, don't actually interact among each other. Uh, there is uh, also a problem of stigmatization of migrants uh, uh, from uh, Italian people living in this area. Um, it's uh, also a neighborhood dominated by um, crime, like especially drug trade and prostitution, and it's quite neglected by the municipality. And on the other hand, uh, it's a uh, very well positioned because it's located right uh, uh, in the middle between the city center uh, and the historical center of the city and uh, the train station, the central station. Actually, uh, over 12 months ago, 
um, we gathered with the group of volunteers of people inhabitants representatives of local businesses that were living in the city and uh, that were actually aiming and hoping to change the situation of the neighborhood and to do something to really requalify the area uh, without having a clear idea of how to do that therefore uh, from that example, we got we joined forces ALDA as a, a, the European Association for Local Democracy with a long experience in implementing participatory processes. We joined forces with PAMPAS, another local civil society organization that is working. It's a, mainly a group of architects working in the requalification of uh, areas of the cities and the cultural uh, implementation of cultural activities. And through them, we decided to involve uh, friends of friends, basically people that were living in the area. And we proposed to them the idea of starting a participatory process to co-design together a shared vision of the future of the neighborhood. And actually what we asked to these people were, was like, how do we visualize, uh, visualize our neighborhoods in the future? How do we make this change happen? How can we uh, start a change at the local level? And uh, we started this participatory process that actually brought incredible results. The first step was uh, the establishment of a spark group. It was this group of uh, people that were main, mainly uh, people that friends of friends, people that uh, were aiming to get committed and get involved in the requalification of the area. And through them, we used them as ambassadors to uh, organize a first public consultation involving uh, really inhabitants of the neighborhood, people that would just pass by here because they would work here, people that would actually live here, owners of apartments, but also tenants and the local businesses. And we organized the first public consultation gathering over 100 representative people. Uh, and we used the methodology of work cafe. Therefore, we divided the, uh, the participants in tables of discussions. We organized five tables of discussions that were aimed at defining the most important criticities uh, and the problems of the area uh, and uh, identify also sort of proposals uh, of wishes that people had regarding the, the neighborhood and also we also brainstormed on possible ideas to fund these proposals, these possible ideas and also on best practices of other ideas that already happened in other neighborhoods of the city or either in other cities or in the past in the same neighborhood that could be replicated at the look here in this neighborhood. Um, after that, uh, at the, this first consultation helped us uh, designing like a real image, a concrete idea of which were the problems and which were the potentialities of this area. And therefore, we, uh, we actually told the participants, okay, there are all of these 50 proposals and we are not able to implement all of them. It's impossible, we're just a civil society organizations. Who is willing to change, to do something for your own neighborhood, for the place where you live? And we, uh, a lot of people came forward, like uh, we organized, a, we created the so-called Scintilla group because it's really this Scintilla in Italian means spark. So it, it was really this, this spark um, from which everything started. Uh, and we formed a first group made of around 30 people that subdivided in uh, small working groups uh, uh, focusing on specific actions. Some of them were organizing, I don't know, a treasure hunts for children. We organized itinerant parties in the neighborhood uh, with the, um, a DJ in a on a bike that would drive the people from one bar to another. Therefore, we include, we worked in cooperation with local businesses. We organized a creative contest to fund ideas in the neighborhood. And uh, like, uh, therefore, people started to work concretely in um, small working groups. Uh, after that, uh, we, 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 at the same time, while we were organizing these kind of activities that were bringing a benefit uh, uh, to the inhabitants in the short term, we also continued our reflection and discussions regarding the possible future development of the neighborhood. Therefore, 
we named some ambassadors that were actually representatives of this Scintilla group, and they were representatives of the participatory process within their big building that are sort of high towers gathering uh, several like uh, hundreds of apartments. And we organized some larger consult consultations for each building. Therefore, through the ambassadors, we worked uh, per groups of buildings, and we continue this conversation with inhabitants, always using the method of uh, work of it, in order to really uh, concretize and to have a more concrete and more clear idea of the potentialities and challenges of the neighborhood. This is a picture of one of these events where actually we, it was a rainy day, and although that, like over, uh, there were at least 50 uh, children that came, it was a really, great um, project um, and uh, actually uh, the result of this consultation phase drove us to the final proposal which was the we decided to uh, invert I'm sorry there is a mistake here to invert to invert the negative pers perspective towards the neighborhood using a positive slogan the place to be like uh, this neighborhood could potentially be really the place to be because there are high towers. It's really the only urban area of the city uh, with high towers, uh, presence of uh, multi-ethnic multi uh, shops uh, and uh, um, restaurants. Uh, there is a lot of potential. Um, and we can actually decide to invest on the the new models of work, like the new uh, models of working together, like uh, for instance co-working spaces uh, uh, and similar, and therefore we realized that it was not enough, that everything that we were doing on a voluntary basis was not enough, and out of this reflection uh, we decided to create the Scintilla factory. The Scintilla factory, it's a, so we, it, it means that we took the Scintilla group and we are now uh, creating for ourselves um, a real institution that in, concretely it's going to be a part of a, a project of ALDA. ALDA is going to offer the Scintilla group uh, the mentoring uh, and the knowledge, the know-how on how to raise, uh, to, to fundraise for this kind of projects uh, and all of the other more structural projects that will come out from Scintilla. But the Scintilla is still managed by inhabitants of the group. Therefore, uh, it's still a participatory group deciding on the future of the neighborhood, implementing uh, very, very concrete projects. For instance, we're talking about building a, a bicycle a path, new paths, in a, an area that is very much affected by traffic. Uh, we are talking about the possibility of opening uh, small cafes and bars where people can gather and to make all of this area more uh, sustainable, but also more pleasant to live in. Um, and uh, actually, I think that this process brought very, very positive results. For instance, uh, a lot of people that usually didn't know each other, that actually were totally isolated, is now part of a group. Therefore, we developed a sense of ownership and sense of belonging toward the neighborhood. A lot of people of different ages, as you can see in this picture, are now working together and uh, are bringing ideas, are bringing connections, are bringing... Uh, uh, relations uh, with possible donors uh, and therefore this project is really growing. Uh, we are working on the neighborhood requalification with a clear idea of what is gonna happen, how, like we have an objective that is uh, become the place to be and uh, to, do, to go there we, we are developing plans like an action plan that we co-designed with inhabitants of the neighborhood of different ages and also ethnicities. Um, and we're going into that direction with a new tool, which is the Scintilla Factory, which is going to be a sort of association itself made of inhabitants uh, to requalify the neighborhood.
So this is uh, the end of my short presentation. I hope it was useful. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much, Sofia. Uh, I give now the floor to, to Gloria uh, to speak about uh, the SMART project. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. I'm going to uh, show you my presentation. So um, I'm here to represent La Piccionaia, which is, uh, which, um, as uh, Eva mentioned before, is a center for theater production based in, uh, in Vicenza. And uh, the participatory practice that uh, I would like to present to you today is what we call the uh, silent play, is a participatory process involving uh, theater and uh, theater techniques to work with the local communities. Uh, we are going to, we are <laughs> about to implement <clears throat> this <clears throat> methodology within a, a project called SMART, uh, which is uh, uh, for the moment has stopped uh, due to the suspension of the activity, but we hope to, uh, to start uh, again very soon. And uh, this project uh, is uh, aimed to enhance the Alpine area uh, and to foster sustainable development, in particular, uh, uh, sustainable and inclusive tourism. So uh, the target are not uh, the uh, most known and uh, places and th those more involved by the traditional uh, tourism uh, routes. Uh, but uh, the more isolated places, uh, the small places, small communities, small villages, uh, which suffers from isolation and from the uh, danger of uh, the dispersal of the community itself. So how to enhance a territory and how to empower this community, these communities. Uh, in order to uh, enhance uh, uh, tourism, uh, we need the territory to represent itself to the outside. But uh, in order to do that, a territory has, uh, in first place, to represent itself to itself. So a community has to represent itself to itself as a community. Uh, local community members need to be aware of their local uh, their own local heritage uh, to, recogni to recognize themselves in, the, in a common, in a shared heritage uh, as a community. Uh, when we talk uh, about uh, um, local cultural heritage, in this case we are more talking about uh, uh, not uh, important buildings, uh, famous objects, uh, but uh, mainly of everyday life and everyday places, uh, which are uh, those who need uh, more uh, our attention because uh, they, they often become uh, silent. Uh, we, we take them for granted uh, and so they, they tend to become meaningless, uh, but not because they are meaningless but because we lose uh, our capacity uh, to, to listen to them, to really look at them. Uh, so to recover this, uh, these abilities uh, allows people to, um, to know and to be aware of their local uh, cultural heritage. In, and the, the, the important thing is to do the, this process in an emotional way. So it is not an academic learning, a merely rational learning, but an emotional one, which is the one who is capable to, to, to trigger uh, a sense of belonging and care uh, among uh, people in the community. Uh, this is what we, what we think is really community empowerment, because uh, the, rec the recognition, what, what generates a community is the recognition of a collective heritage. Uh, the tools uh, that we are going to use for participation uh, within SMART will be uh, workshop, workshop sessions within the communities, uh, in particular workshops uh, of uh, dramaturgical writing. And this writing will deal with the local heritage. And, uh, 
another thing is an online platform that will be used to will be open to the citizenship and will be used to collect documents and materials also private documents of every kind from community members the result of this uh, material collected the result of the uh, workshop of, of uh, dramaturgical writing will be a collective dramaturgy so created by the members of the local community. <laughs> this collective dramaturgy will become a soundtrack uh, for an itinerary in the territory. So this soundtrack that the people will hear in, in headphones will guide uh, the outside, the visitors from outside to discover the local heritage. But uh, the most important thing is that uh, to get to this result, uh, so the, the thing is not the result, the main thing is the process, because uh, this will be not uh, a dramaturgy uh, imposed from, uh, from above or coming from above, but uh, will be a, a, a dramaturgy, a, a product, a, a theatrical product created by the local members of the community in a process that will allow them to recognize their local heritage, recognize their own identity as a community. And so uh, the community in this process is uh, really the main player. And this is what we call, again, empowerment. This is true learning because a, a, a participatory process is, is always a, an educational process also. But when emotions uh, are, 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 are involved, the, the what is the, the educational process is more is more deep and so theater is very useful uh, as a tool uh, to trigger this emotional uh, learning because it uh, it involves uh, uh, non rational uh, non rational parts of uh, of the human being and is also very useful because uh, uh, in this project we are dealing with uh, how to represent a community to itself, to the outside, how to represent a territory. So it's basically about uh, telling stories and that this is what theater does. So the, the, the process uh, which we call silent play uh, is uh, a participatory process of collective dramaturgies for itineraries in, itineraries in the territories. This is uh, the summary of the meaning of silent play, which is, by the way, <clears throat> something uh, developed, uh, conceived and developed, uh, developed by our director and playwright, uh, Carlo Presotto. These are some images from uh, past uh, projects uh, involving this uh, participatory process uh, uh, with silent play. So you can see uh, uh, people going around in the territory, asking questions to other people, touching objects, uh, making experience. Uh, this is the way we uh, we 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 propose uh, to 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 get to know uh, each one's territory. These are some other images, and this is. Uh, uh, I, I want to spend some words, uh, only a few words, uh, about parish maps because this is a great uh, reference uh, and an inspiration source uh, for our uh, silent play uh, practice. Parish maps were born in England at the beginning of the 80s, and uh, you can see an example. This is a parish map. map. You see, it is a map, but it's not a, a, a normal map because um, it is a, a tool to understand and enhance local heritage through the active in, and creative involvement of the local communities. You can see the local dimension is, uh, is, uh, is pointed out in this map, the perception of inhabitants towards the elements of their, of their everyday life and a territory of which the participants to the process have direct knowledge. So the relationship between places and inhabitants, places and people. And this is also some two other examples of uh, parish maps uh, in England. And uh, another important reference which uh, grow up upon this, uh, this, uh, this concept is the, the definition of landscape within 
the European Landscape Convention of year 2000. Landscape is a part of the land as perceived by local people or visitors, which uh, evolves through time as a result of being acted upon by natural forces and human beings. So, the both together. Uh, so we are to um, we are now. I'm going to go a bit in the deep of silent play uh, technique. Um, the the conduction of the process is uh, is in charge of a multidisciplinary equip uh, coordinated by uh, a theatre director and a playwright as conductors and facilitators and of course with uh, expertise in a participatory process and uh, educational um, pro processes. And they are accompanied by uh, different figures, uh, depending professional figures, depending on the environment, uh, on the context of the intervention. Uh, they can be cultural mediators, anthropologists, architects, uh, sociologists, uh, urbanists, uh, art historian, etc. And these are the steps. Very quickly, I'm going to explain you the steps of a silent play participatory process. First one is the, the preparation. The preparation is in charge of the uh, conductors, so the, the equip of experts. And uh, uh, they analyze the local context, they study, they do interviews with local witnesses. They analyze space, time, which are the social players, which are, will be the genres, genres of representation, which are the rituals and the communication styles used in the community, uh, which is the dramaturgical material present in the community, which are the stories, which are the objects, uh, we, which is the environment. Uh, so a, a, a step of planning and design. Then there is the activation we are going to uh, implement uh, a public event within the local community, so addressed to individ local individuals, local associations, local cultural operators, representatives of local authorities, and the, ex the project will be explained with its met methods, its, its timeline and its uh, uh, purposes. And also, uh, the participatory campaign of uh, collection of contents uh, through the uh, online platform that I mentioned before will be open in this, uh, in this occasion. Then we are to the very heart of the process, which is the participatory creation uh, of, the, of this dramaturgy. Uh, this will be this will be developed uh, through workshop sessions within the, with the local community members uh, and conducted by the equip uh, that I mentioned before. Um, it will start with question like questions like uh, where are we? What makes this place different from the uh, from the others? Which elements it, is it composed by? What is relevant at individual and collective le level and why? Which are the natural qualities of the place? Which are the individual knowledges? This allows people to interact, to recover memories, to share knowledges, non-written knowledges, know-how, uh, all this immaterial culture that uh, uh, otherwise is, is in danger to be. Uh, to be forgotten, and this is a, a this trigger a progressive immersion of a narration, uh, which is usually a narration that was hidden before before the process. So the the main role of the conductors uh, is uh, in this process is to the, the ability to listen and tune on the wavelength of the environment to bring to the light the hidden narrative that exist under the, the surface of everyday life to challenge the context, to explore the limit, to explore the boundaries. And above all, not to reproduce something that is visible, but to make the invisible visible. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to only mention some techniques that we are going to use because we really don't have time to uh, to go uh, deep with that. But you, 
if you are interested, you, you can easily find information on them on them uh, on the website uh, very easily. Uh, so we use techniques of both from theater and from social sciences. From theater, we have, as I mentioned, uh, dramaturgical writing, but also physical theater, which is very used uh, during the, the workshop uh, sessions. Forum theater, which is uh, also linked with participative theater, they are very, uh, very, very important technique of participative theater, but also techniques from theater, theatrical animations and autobiographical workshop and community storytelling. From social sciences, we work with tools as uh, such as brainstorming, world cafes, focus groups, photo voice and critical incident. Uh, I try to uh, sum up the impact of, uh, of this process. I don't know if I have time to, uh, <clears throat> to present the impact, otherwise you can easily uh, have, take a look at, at them in the, um, in the presentation that you can get. But uh, the main thing is to empower individuals and communities uh, taking uh, actively care uh, uh, enabling people to take actively care as citizens of their own territories. Of course, these uh, foster uh, individual abilities, individual uh, empowerment, uh, uh, capability of critical reading and interpretation of the reality, uh, better environment for the flourishing of energies of creation, of integration, uh, uh, this prevent the dispersal of the local communities, making them capable, the point is, uh, to reconnect uh, their local cultural heritage, reconnect it to the present and to the future, making them capable to address uh, the challenges of the, of the present and the future of our uh, contemporary world. And so, I finished. Thank you very much, Gloria, for your intervention. Thank you. It was very, very interesting. Thank um, you. I give the floor to Ivana to talk about the project uh, Monumental 9. Hello to everybody. So uh, today I will be presenting, I'm uh, Eva from Alda Skopje. Uh, today I will be presenting the Monument, Monumental 9 uh, project, uh, which uh, is actually, um, I will start my presentation. So. Uh, what is the Monumental Nine? It's a nine-month project that, he, that uh, is actually implemented by the seven local democracy agencies uh, from the Western Balkans countries uh, and Alda Skopje, which are actually members of the Balkan Network for Local Democracy. So uh, the main objective of our project is to help uh, to create a new tourism product uh, to increase youth employment uh, and uh, um, activities that will generate income through engaging micro localities, youth greeters, vloggers in uh, this regional cooperation program. So, uh, um, this is our partners actually. We have uh, LDM Montenegro as our uh, as our main partner, so our lead partner, we have the other agencies from Priyadur, Mostar, Zavidovic, Subotica, Knyazhavac, Pea and Skopje. So the involved countries are uh, North Macedonia, uh, Kosovo, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia in this project. So it's a really regional project, uh, regional project from the Western Balkans. Uh, so so uh, our donor is the Regional Cooperation Council through the Tourism Development Promotional uh, Project Grants Program. And actually from February, uh, we, we are part from on the, of the Monumental, uh, Balkan Monumental Trail, which is a new uh, initiative uh, to connect uh, the Western Balkans, both historically and artistically. Uh, you can find information on the internet if you're interested more in this uh, trail. So what are our activities in the project? Uh, we uh, started with the training for greeters and vloggers uh, for, uh, lo uh, for youngsters. Uh, we will have an uh, uh, online platform that will be created for the project and for the activities. We have desk research on micro localities, really recreational tours, local activities and a closing event in Nikšić Montenegro. So uh, actually our main uh, objective, our main 
actors in our project are the micro localities. The micro localities are actually a monument from the Second World, World War that were built uh, in uh, to honor uh, the to honor actually our winnings from the war. So these are uh, nine monuments which are. Um, how to say a little bit forgotten, uh, forgotten, uh, forgotten part of history. So our idea is to raise awareness about these uh, nine micro localities, uh, not just about the monuments, but uh, the history around them, and also the uh, the localities, uh, the landscape, as Gloria said, around them. So you can see we have the Memorial Park in Niš, we have the Macedonium in uh, Krušavo, North Macedonia, the Partisan Cemetery in Mostar. So these all are monuments that actually uh, they uh, battle time, but uh, they just slipped out of the memory of uh, the persons and the tourists. So what is our idea actually and uh, what is uh, the participatory process that actually we use to, to raise awareness about this, uh, local, these localities? We have three tours uh, that we will organize in order to collect some information about these projects. Uh, they include all of the nine um, micro localities, but also uh, another uh, localities that are connected with the history of the monuments. Uh, you can see the three tours. I won't get in details. You can see the three tours on your screen. I hope uh, that uh, the they will be. Uh, we are still organizing them and seeing how to organize it uh, because uh, the pandemic is uh, a little bit problematic for uh, traveling in the moment, as you all know. So um, the idea is actually uh, the training for bloggers and greeters was um, our main opportunity to recruit some young persons from 17 until 30 years of age that would actually uh, uh, be, uh, be some kind of touristical guides for these micro localities. The same persons were, uh, would uh, travel on these tours and uh, discover this moment, monument and create some interesting touristical uh, content in order to promote them. So, this context uh, is actually really versatile. We don't want to simply describe the monuments. We want to see how the uh, monuments live in their community and what uh, role they have actually in helping the community thrive. So uh, we, will, uh, we will talk about history of the monuments. Uh, our greeters and vloggers will discover the cultural diversity of the uh, the monuments the, and also the area where the monuments are built. So they will uh, discover uh, they will discover uh, culinary specialties, dishes. Uh, they will contact local craftsmen, uh, craftsmanships uh, places where they can uh, where they can discover local products. So the main idea: how do we ensure actually the uh, the uh, the, uh, how we will ensure actually the part participation of the local community. So you can't have the information if you don't uh, meet with these people. So the idea is to meet the local, the locals, talk with them, and share their stories in our uh, in our project, in our context, and uh, ensure that their stories be heard and be part of these touristical offers. So uh, our greeters and vloggers and the participants in our tour will meet uh, local persons with, uh, they will meet the local chefs, uh, they will uh, meet uh, people on the market, talk with them and uh, sh share their unique stories about the monuments, uh, share the unique stories uh, about the about the micro localities and that's how actually the content that we want to offer on our online platform will be shaped by the community and not only by uh, the creator that will be will be creating it so uh, this is a tool that um, youngsters not only our greeters and vloggers uh, can use actually to create um and employment opportunities and uh, they can stay in their own community and uh, crea uh, create uh, a living for themselves. 
So uh, we want to get out of this uh, standard uh, touristical offers to offer something more artistic, more interesting, and to uh, revive uh, these elements of history that are uh, long forgotten. So this is actually a principle that uh, can be replicated everywhere, not only not only in this locality. So it's uh, the idea it's to be uh, to, uh, to be general and to be used everywhere. So and uh, by everybody. So uh, we hope that uh, with this project, uh, we will not only inspire our trainees, but inspire also the local community to uh, present, uh, to offer some uh, unique opportunities for tourism for people who want alternative tourism uh, elements, but not only them, but also the also uh, classical tourists. So. Uh, I hope that uh, in the next period we will continue with uh, organizing the tours and uh, other elements of the of the um, of this project. Uh, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are not still uh, sure how this will be will proceed. But uh, we also have the local activities for raising awareness for. Uh, um, building the visibility of this project and the activities uh, which uh, every community will do and every uh, project partner will do in order to uh, uh, in order to promote uh, promote actually the local tourism and the tourism of its uh, micro localities but also their own communities so uh, in the next few months we have a difficult task to finish everything to create uh, to start creating it and to uh, start uh, contacting uh, locals and uh, to see how this uh, project will develop uh, so stay tuned and uh, uh, we will share everything uh, in the future with you so that's uh, from me it's uh, short and sweet i think <laughs> So I will leave the floor to the next uh, to the next speaker. Uh, it's Alexandra, I think. Thank you very much, Ivana, for sharing with us um, your experience and uh, good luck with implementation of the project. Thank you, thank you, Alexandra. I give you the floor. Hello, everybody. I'm Alessandra Dal Pozzolo from Studio Progetto, that is a social cooperative uh, based in the northeast part of Italy, in Veneto region, Vicenza province. Um, we are um, we offer we provide social social services addressed to uh, children, to youth, to people with disability, uh, people with uh, special needs and fewer opportunities, elderly people, and also refugees and migrants. So we are. Um, Quite a medium big organization. We have uh, around 250 uh, employers and members. Now, today, I will present you a project that we are um, managing. Is uh, the title is from me to EU that. Uh, that stay for from migrants engagement to European upgrade. It's a project uh, funded by the European for Citizen program. Um, uh, we uh, started this project in November 2018 and we supposed to end it uh, in April 2020 but uh, due to the coronavirus uh, we had an we asked for an extension so we can go further uh, for 12 months uh, and, and and conclude the project uh, next year uh, the project uh, involves uh, par uh, partners from uh, uh, eight European countries, uh, from Albania, Belgium, Croatia, Greece, Italy, of course, we are um, the, the, lead, the lead partner, uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia, Poland and Spain. Uh, from each country, we have two partners. We have a, um, an NGO, a non-profit organization, and a public uh, institution, uh, a municipality or um, a public institute. Um, the project is divided into three different phases. Um, 
we named the, the, the first phase uh, my Europe, my history. Uh, I need the second phase is I need I need you and you need me. And the last phase uh, is um, SOS volunteers. Um, we uh, each phase is is uh, composed by two um, two by an intervention an international event uh, in which all the partners partic participate and uh, a local phase uh, that each country each partner uh, will uh, implement in uh, the local level. So the first uh, the first phase uh, was uh, um, discovery. It was aimed to discover the um, European Union and the, um, uh, the the aim was to put in contact uh, uh, European citizen with uh, um, uh, migrant citizen. So uh, we uh, had the first uh, international training course uh, in Brussels in March uh, 2019 with uh, uh, 56 uh, participants coming from the partner organization. Uh, in this uh, training course, uh, we, uh, ex we uh, experiment some methods uh, to um, use during the local workshop that each country, each partner uh, put uh, in the um, in the um, in action uh, in the in the uh, in the second step. Uh, the second step was, were the local activities. So each partner um, did a workshop in his uh, country uh, with a group of at least 26 people. And um, uh, the, uh, the participants uh, should be also, uh, the, the workshops should uh, involve also uh, migrants uh, and refugees in the activities. Uh, we uh, did the laboratories, uh, um, artistic um, activities, uh, but also uh, participatory uh, um, discussion. And um, we, uh, in this, uh, in this. Um, workshop we involve the local citizen uh, and put in contact with the migrants here you can see uh, some photos some pictures from the local activities from our partners then we we went uh, in we um, passed to the uh, second phase uh, that it was called i need you and you need me uh, it started with a training course uh, in spain in saragossa last july 2019 and uh, the main aim was to um, set up um, the um, questions for the interviews that uh, had to be collected in the local phase. Uh, so we made some activities, we um, worked to, um, we discussed about the problems that migrants are facing uh, coming in, into our countries and uh, we, um, we uh, try to uh, imagine some uh, questions to uh, understand what, are, what they are living here and also some questions for the European citizens that uh, how, how, they, um, uh, how they feel, how they perceive the phenomenon of the, 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 the migration. So in the local phase, uh, we collect each, uh, each uh, country, each partner collected uh, 50 video interviews uh, for a total of uh, 400 um, interviews. And uh, uh, the target group was uh, to collect at least uh, uh, 30 interviews uh, to European citizens and 22 migrants. Um, we, uh, at the end, we, um, each partner uh, put together the interviews in a video. Uh, now we published the, the interviews in our uh, website uh, that is uh, www.fromme2eu.com. Uh, 
uh, here you can see six interview because we are still waiting from um, the, the videos from two uh, partners uh, I don't think we have uh, time to to see one of these interview but you can um, the link are active so you can download the presentation from the webinar and uh, you can have uh, you can list, uh, listen to the interviews um then uh, the last phase uh, the, after the interviews uh, we organized uh, local workshops to um discuss uh, um uh, what uh, uh, the outcomes from the the video interviews uh, the questions in the interviews uh, were like uh, um what can you do what what can you put uh, um uh, to this uh, what can you do for other people uh, so we asked to european citizen what if they can do something uh, to help uh, the migrants and uh, vice versa uh, so we asked to migrants if they can uh, put some competencies skills uh, or uh, their time to help uh, the european citizen the aim is to foster a match uh, between uh, european citizens and migrants and uh, a mutual uh, help uh, in which uh, uh, both of them can uh, be useful uh, to each other uh, so in these workshops uh, we uh, discuss about this and we found out uh, some uh, example uh, in which uh, uh, migrants and european citizens can be helpful uh, for uh, for each other this uh, we will go uh, into the website uh, we uh, in uh, in our website there is a part there is a um, uh, a session uh, where uh, there are uh, the uh, local forum one for each uh, country uh, in which uh, um, uh, migrants and uh, citizens can and uh, Euro european local citizens can put their offers or uh, they can they can search uh, what uh, the help they need so um, the the website unfortunately is not um, working now in this phase because um, due to the pandemic we had the lockdown so it's not uh, easy to help uh, uh, physically uh, the people uh, so uh, we uh, asked for a prolong of the project to implement the the, the, the forum and uh, to do the last final meeting in um, uh, hopefully at the end of the uh, of this year uh, so um, we uh, we uh, already did uh, some um, local events uh, big local events to promote uh, the platform but still we are we have to promote it um, deeper and to improve uh, this platform and uh, to fix some small problem so we are working uh, on this uh, during the summer and uh, we will uh, find uh, we will fi finally meet uh, with our partners in the final conferences here in uh, Italy uh, in autumn 2020 and uh, we will award uh, the best practice uh, um, among the the, the 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 forum the blog and uh, we will uh, uh, close the, the the project uh, at the end of the year i hope okay i think i finished i was very fast because we were run of time but if you have questions, you can um, take a look to our website or you can, down, uh, you can write some questions. I will be ha happy to, to reply. Thank you for the presentation of this very interesting project. And now I give the floor to uh, Anna Ditta to, to give you an overview of the funding programs related to the topic. Thank you, Anna. Okay, super. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, um, 
Thank you very much to all the, the colleagues that uh, intervened before me. The presentations were really interesting and inspiring. Uh, I might link up with uh, some of the things that you said. Uh, so my role here is to close basically uh, the presentation of today by giving a few insights of the European funds that, uh, uh, that cover uh, the possibility uh, to deliver, to uh, develop, to implement participatory uh, processes. Um, but before giving you a couple of examples, and it's not going to be an exhaustive list, I would like to um, focus your attention, uh, draw your attention on something very important. Exactly, which EU funds? But before speaking about EU funds, uh, let's consider first this important uh, concept, because on a general note, uh, uh, we shall remember that there is one major concept, which is cross-cutting to all the European Union programs, uh, and that shall constantly guide us. So no matter what uh, new program you, uh, you use uh, to, to fund your initiatives, so it's important to remember that common to all the European Union frame, is the concept of the concept of ownership of the results by the beneficiaries of our actions. So, what is the ownership of the results? Sophia, my colleague, this morning mentioned this word, uh, but I would like to insist on this because this is really the key, um, the key concept that uh, that needs to be uh, implemented in each project, and that is the. Uh, tied up very uh, tightly with the, the concept of participation. So basically ownership means that beneficiaries are not only passive recipients of top-down project actions, but they are main actors in bringing change. So um, it means that no matter uh, what the program, the funding program uh, we use, uh, we should always imagine some actions that uh, engage the citizens directly. They get, uh, they get them involved in the uh, elaboration of the practices that we want to bring to the community. So, um, like for example, uh, Gloria mentioned before, um, it, uh, it can be it can be theater or it can be a workshop. It can be uh, a technique um, uh, that, that mentioned that Sophia mentioned, like a world cafe. Um, it can be a focus group. Uh, they can be different techniques. It can be a storytelling. Uh, it can be a contest, uh, um, it, but any, no matter what we use, creativity is really, is really good here. Uh, the important thing is that we engage the citizens in the change we want to bring. So, for example, it's okay in a project to deliver a training uh, to participants, but then I should uh, enable them to put into practice what they learned to um, to not only to make sure they understand what I train them about, but also to make sure that they uh, they become the owners of those skills, of those knowledges. They, it's like uh, uh, I liked what uh, what Gloria said this morning. I even took a note about that. She said, you know, to uh, to to make people learn, to make. Uh, uh, them recognize the community, you need to develop the sense of belonging. So how can I make, how can I uh, push a person to have a sense of belonging, uh, of, uh, about something, about uh, an heritage, about uh, uh, whatever it is? Uh, um, I need to engage this person directly, so I, I need to um, make her acting in first person. So that is why all these examples that our colleagues uh, um, gave this morning are so, so uh, important and consistent with, um, with the concept of participation process. So ownership, uh, you will always find this, uh, this even the question um, in the application forms uh, that, um, that you uh, measure with uh, in your project, you, you will often find the question, how do you ensure the ownership of the results? The, the ownership is ensured by engaging the people, by getting them participating, by getting them making the change, uh, they, them directly. Uh, so, 
Uh, exactly, as I said, no matter what, what the EU program is, uh, this is really a, a cross-cutting concept. Uh, in fact, we have seen different examples from very diverse programs this morning. Um, for example, the silent play that Gloria told you about, the small communities revitalization, was uh, funded by an interreg, there's a mistake here in the title, an interreg Italy-Austria. So this is... Um, a program funded within the cohesion policy of the European Union aimed at reducing the disparities between territories, disparately the disparities in uh, economic, institutional, cultural, political terms, social terms. Um, and in this in this program, which is um, a very big, big, uh, big program. There is, there must be space for uh, participatory processes. And the way we found to uh, to exploit this uh, participatory process was uh, the, the the silent play, among others. So the role of Pichonaya is very important in this frame. But then uh, we have uh, our colleague Eva that presented a very different. Um, uh, program, um, which is the Regional Cooperation Council uh, Montenegro um, institution fund uh, that is using European Union funds to fund this uh, this project. Uh, she told uh, she told us about Monumental Nine. So this is again another program completely different from uh, the Interreg Italy Austria. And then Alessandra told us about uh, um, another very very important program, uh, um, which is called Europe for Citizens, that funded the From Me to You uh, project. And we are going to talk a little more about this. Uh, but in general, uh, we can find the space to develop participatory process in all the programs, uh, even programs that concern with the uh, environment, uh, programs that concern uh, um, migrants, for example, programs uh, that, uh, that deal with uh, very diverse topics. Uh, so the participation of the citizens is not, uh, uh, often is not uh, only a result or an ob objective, but it's a process. So how do I bring uh, environmental sustainability in my community? By involving the people, by getting them informed, uh, by organizing this or that world coffee or a theater play, no matter what I use, I, um, I can use different te techniques to get the people engaged. Um, so this, these are the examples that our colleagues presented this morning. In the case of the requalification of Viale Milano, there is not a European program, not yet. So every, everything has been brought about uh, on a voluntary basis uh, with our own resources. And uh, of course, to make it sustainable, we will need to ask money to, to European Union or, or other funds. So for the moment, this is, uh, this is volu on voluntary basis. But we can also mention uh, um, many different programs that dedicate space uh, to, to participatory process. Uh, um, here it's just one example. Uh, almost uh, all the programs that are dedicated to youth third countries, so to those countries that are not members of the EU, for example, the Balkans or the Mediterranean area or uh, any other area in the world, they have a very specific measure dedicated to um, uh, propose uh, really concrete uh, and participative activities um, with the civil society, organized or not, so directed to NGOs or also to citizens. And this part is called financial support to third parties. So it's uh, um, a specific bunch of the part of the budget dedicated to get the, the beneficiaries um, doing their own activities with their own funds. So it's basically a grant within the European grant, but not dedicated to partners, dedicated to, to the partners of the project, I mean, but dedicated to the citizens, to the civil society, to the local authorities, to the local communities, precisely for them to become main actors of the change. So to use this fund to produce themselves something out of what they learned uh, during the project. So this, this is just uh, an example, but we have many, many programs uh, 
many, many European programs where we can include the participation processes, and this is always very welcome. There are some programs which are specifically conceived uh, to promote participatory process and active citizenship. So the main program in this sense is the Europe for Citizen Support. So it's the program that funded from me to you, the project that uh, Alessandra um, told you about. So this program is really, really the one who's dedicated, I mean, whose objective is to reduce the distance between the EU institutions and the EU citizens. How? By stimulating democratic engagement and civic participation. Um, actually, this program, uh, most of you probably know it, uh, is the program that funds uh, uh, actions for active remembrance, so to remember why European Union was created and to celebrate the, um, the difficult uh, uh, steps that uh, led to the creation of European Union, so the World War I, World War II, and, um, but another strand is dedicated to the democratic and, um, engagement and civic participation of citizens. So for municipalities, for NGOs, for citizens. So the nice thing of this program is that uh, it doesn't matter what topic you choose. You might, decide, uh, you might decide to work on a topic that is important for the communities, which could be Migrants, as Alessandra said, it can be environment, it can be um, sustainable development, it can be um, leaving the peripheries of the cities, uh, it can be supporting the inclusion of disabled people, it can be literally anything, provided that the way you try to bring results is done in a participatory way. So what matters here is not the result, it's not what you get at the end. Of course, it's important what you get at the end, but the process is what matters most. So if you're going, for example, to work on a, on a project about the requalification of uh, former uh, industrial areas in your city, um, of course, uh, this program is not uh, dedicated to uh, restore buildings, all right? It's not dedicated to do infrastructural works uh, to create a beautiful uh, green park uh, where there was uh, a farm before. The idea is to get the citizens around the table to discuss what is best for them. So um, the solutions that uh, communities search to their problems uh, should be searched for in a participatory way with the involvement of common citizens. Uh, so with the involvement of also those citizens that normally will not uh, be so active, uh, that uh, do not volunteer, that maybe do not go to vote, uh, that uh, do not feel um, the need to intervene in the public life of their community. Of course, uh, these projects uh, bring together also the support of experts or policymakers, but the core um, person, the core actor in this project uh, is the citizen and the civil society, like uh, organized civil society, for example, like NGOs and the local authorities as well. So the, the, the political level, which is the closest to the citizen, because the change happens locally. So it's true that projects, that European projects need a transnational component, need a transnational cooperation, but the change always happens locally because it's the sphere where I live. So it's always important to combine these two dimensions. So the participation is local, but then we can compare what we did locally with other realities and see if we can uh, harmonize our actions, our practice, our policies to improve the, the, the inclusive and democratic life in our societies. Another interesting program in this respect, but I, I really, I really um, want to tell you that this is not an exhaustive list uh, because, as I said, uh, the participation can happen in no matter what program. Okay. Right to quality and citizenship. It's another program uh, which is uh, um, managed by the DG Justice of the European Commission, and its its uh, objective is to support the equality and rights of the citizens. For example, gender equality. So we have many, many projects dedicated to uh, work on gender issues, uh, uh, also combating violence against women, against children. And this too can be done, of course, with the help of experts, but also with engagement of uh, 
uh, women, like uh, women from the community or men from the community. So participatory process is very welcome here. EU citizenship, for example, there are projects that deal with uh, EU mobile citizens, so the rights of the uh, European citizens that live in another EU, uh, EU country, a country with, which is not their own country. Rights of the child, combating discrimination on the widest level possible, like hate speech, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Gypsyism, uh, any sort of discrimination. And of course, this uh, this program is very, very well uh, is very well placed. is very interesting because in here we can use storytelling, we can use uh, videos, we can use contests, uh, we can use sensitization campaigns. A lot of work can be done by involving the uh, the communities, so the the, the normal citizens. Um, but it's not all, okay? It's not all because, for example, when Gloria was uh, mentioning this morning the parish maps. Uh, uh, I remember that we, we just submitted an Erasmus Plus project, for example, whose main um, objective is to include uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers in the EU communities where they end up living. And how are we going to do that? Through parish maps. Uh, so we are going to identify those places that are special to the local citizens and that are special to the refugees. So to get the ones uh, knowing the others' culture, and to uh, name and identify places that for them feel home. So uh, this is again an activity to foster the ownership, the appropriation of the spaces and of the community. So uh, as I said already, there are many uh, techniques uh, that we can use to stimulate participatory approaches, uh, uh, ranging from storytelling to non-formal education methods, uh, uh, involving individual group work, creativity, uh, there are citizen panels who work at the open space technology. Uh, there are digital platforms, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we are stuck in our houses, and also the participation suffers from that. So we all find ways to 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 face this challenge. And uh, digital platforms are a way to connect uh, the people when and where they cannot gather physically. So there is no, what I want to say is that there is no limit to your creativity if you want to bring about a participatory process. So uh, don't, pose, don't pose limits to your creativity. All the programs uh, are um, more or less are keen and are open to, to this. Thank you so much. If you uh, have questions, you can write me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. It was a uh, very interesting presentation and uh, very useful. Um, I would also like to remind you that uh, you can find all the presentations on the handout uh, section where you can download, download them. Maybe if yes, someone is raising uh, the hand, uh, Pedro. Hello, I'm Pedro from Valongo, Portugal. Um, I was. Uh, I have a question to Anna. I was just checking the the PDF and the presentation, and I was wondering. Uh, I think it's on the third slide, when the slide that says "No matter what the EU program is," um, uh, I noticed that uh, on the third topic we have Creative Europe. And Medisub, is it the same program that you were talking about, Anna? Um, that, uh, that PowerPoint is not updated. I should have replaced. Uh, should replace it now. We yes. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not the correct one. Uh, that is why I was mentioning uh, another program. Uh, we we have not mentioned that uh, Creative Europe Media. Um, but there is also there are also programs with Creative Europe it, and media. It's another program, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. And um, so, yeah. I was wondering if it's possible to to do this regional um, um, program uh, here in Portugal also. Of course, it's. Uh, is it possible? Of course, isn't it? Sorry, I didn't get the question. <laughs> the regional um, program you were talking about uh, instead of the creative europe it's uh, of yeah. course we can do it here with um, 
uh, for instance, local municipalities or? The program is speci was specifically for the Balkans. It's a regional. Oh, for the Balkans, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a very, very specific one, but uh, there are plenty of uh, European Union programs addressed, of course, to Portugal, especially being a member state of the, state of the European Union. You can benefit of many programs from Erasmus to Europe for Citizens to Interreg to uh, AMIF, uh, the, the, pro the program for migrants to rights, equality, and citizenship, DG justice programs, uh, um, programs dedicated to sustainable development. So there, there is a bunch of, uh, a, a huge bunch of programs that you can use for, uh, for, uh, for your communities. Uh, you have a specific idea for, uh, for, your, uh, for your community because uh, there are many different pro programs depending on uh, the, te the thematic you, you want to work on. Well, um, but together with me in this, in this uh, reunion, we have, uh, I have t uh, three more colleagues and we work in the youth and citizen citizenship department of uh, the municipality of Walongo. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, well a medium-sized municipality that um, it, it it's it's uh, on the outskirts of Porto, so it's a uh, it's a big municipality. And we have at the moment we have a um, European for Citizens, for example, uh, program that we are um, uh, working on. And well, it's uh, when I, when I saw Creative Europe, um, it, it it pop up my my mind because I read it somewhere, um, uh, this program. But I, I was not sure if it's if it, if it was regional or if it was some sort of um, no, specific. Creative Europe, uh, Creative Europe uh, has two strengths. So one is media. And one is uh, culture. Culture. And, uh, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. And culture means literally everything, like from theater, uh, so performing arts, uh, to literature. Uh, it's really, really wide. Uh, and, um, and of course, Portugal is eligible to this type of uh, programs. And, and uh, I, the, last, uh, the last calls are available this year still. Uh, normally, the culture trend uh, is open uh, and calls. Uh, uh, sorry, closes in November, so the call is normally open. Normally opens in uh, September and uh, closes in November. So uh, there is one last shot before the, the closure of the programming period, and then there are specific uh, uh, programs about media, uh, like uh, really for. Uh, video games, movies, uh, anything that concerns media and the circulation of uh, um, works uh, concerning the media, concerning the culture, circulation of uh, uh, artists, uh, circulation of products. Uh, so the, the Creative Europe is, uh, is not a regional program, actually. It's uh, open to all the member states and also beyond, because it's uh, open also to the countries of the neighborhood. So they basically the countries which uh, border with the with the EU, and we do have also Creative Europe uh, programs uh, uh, concerning media and culture. I thought we were going to present them today. That is why you found uh, that uh, that name, but it's um, it's uh, it was not the case today. But we do have. Uh, so if you want to know more about the projects we have, I can get you in touch with the project manager. That, uh, that manages. Uh, we would like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a very, very interesting one, uh, which is about uh, creating digital tools uh, to uh, ensure um, that people can benefit of um, museums, for example, also from home, or they go there and they see the history of uh, what happened in that area, and uh, by by seeing uh, digital uh, digital things i'm i'm not that expert in uh, in the sector so i will get in touch with the with the project manager if you if you wish so okay yeah yes yeah, if, if you please yeah we, we would yeah, like yeah, to yeah, yeah. you are you're interested so, both in media and culture or is or do you have a specific interest well the subject that we uh, 
work its its uh, citizenship and and youth and uh, well we have this uh, um um, main uh, task that we do in, in, in our division that's concerned with the pursuit, the youth pursuit of merchant. Um, and we were wondering if, uh, well, maybe in this program we can we could uh, perhaps uh, present a good practice of uh, our participatory budgets. Um, um, Be careful because that program is really specific for culture. If you for culture. Yeah. Yeah, culture. If you want to uh, talk about youth inclusion, uh, active citizenship mm -hmm. more in general, Europe for Citizens is probably a better That's program. Yeah, uh, but it depends. You know, I don't want to give you an answer which is not precise, but uh, from what you tell me, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, for the inclusion of young people, well, Erasmus Plus is a good program and next deadline is the 1st of October, only for projects that concern youth or youth workers. And uh, for citizens in general, but you can, you can of course decline it, uh, give it a declination for youth, you can work for Europe for Citizen program, whose next and last deadline is the 1st of September. Or to take a look at cultural programs, but they are much more specific and with a higher co-funding rate required. And these, uh, these normally expire in November. Okay, so you, you still have all these possibilities to, to use. Okay, Anna, thank you so much for okay, the clarification, no thanks. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, I can see that Gisela uh, Barbosa would like to oh. take the floor. I'm opening her microphone. Gisela, you can speak now. Hello, I'm also one of the colleagues of Pedro. I work in Valongo also. And um, one of the questions that I have is, we, we are doing our PB, our participatory budgeting for youth since uh, last, the, the, the last seven years. And, uh, one of the things that we are really concerning is about the impact of this PB and all the projects around the PB that we are doing. Uh, what are the real impact in the community? And we 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 would love would love to to discover a, a, a possibility of uh, fundraising this this study of evaluation of the impact. Do you think you can help us with some ideas where we can we can study or search for? Well, uh, we will need to discuss uh, lengthily because uh, it, it, um, you cannot uh, just uh, um, have a project on uh, simply on evaluation on a practice. Okay. You need to build uh, some more uh, some more actions, but uh, I I will need to know more about. Uh, about your work to get a clearer idea and, uh, and tell you but it, it looks very appropriate actually because the impact evaluation is something that is uh, almost is al always left aside yes something that gets evaluated during the time like even one two or three years after the project is over so basically there are never funds to cover this very important part of the story yes exactly so, I completely feel uh, I completely feel you and uh, your concern. Um, I I don't think we can build a project exclusively on uh, impact evaluation um, because we need you know to stick to the to the priorities of each program and each program has uh, priorities that go beyond the simple measurement of impact, of course. But for example, if you want to use the work you do with the participatory budget uh, and the I think uh, I think there is a possibility also in Europe for citizens because this is a very general uh, broad uh, program. Okay. Uh, but we, we need we will need to discuss it further. Okay. I don't want can to... can I, can I write you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can of course. Oh, of course. Thank you, thank you, and thank you all uh, for uh, all of the, the 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 people who spoke. It was very interesting to hear you. Thank you for your examples. Thank you, Gisela. Afaf would like to, to intervene. Hello, good morning, and uh, thank you for ALDA for uh, organizing this uh, conference. Unfortunately, I attend only the, uh, 
um, um, Anna uh, speech, but I would like uh, to, to, to ask a question about uh, capitalization of the results. Uh, do you think that uh, there is a mechanism who supports uh, this process in the programs of the EU? Uh, this is my question because um, I know that uh, for evaluation there is, um, it is, um, it is uh, obligatory or a uh, one of the exigences of the of the um, program, but about capitalization of the results, I don't know if they uh, pay attention to that, and if there is a mechanism of support of this process, because this is maybe um, important uh, to disseminate uh, the results and uh, to build on the these results uh, for uh, for the future and for. Um, uh, for, for the, this participatory process uh, uh, who benefits uh, the uh, citizens. Um, my second um, question it is about the needs assessment um, that should be the first step in development proposals. But it is always hard to, to serve these needs uh, and uh, how to include in them at uh, low level, uh, it means at uh, citizen level, um, with a program who have um, ambitions and um, um, uh, let's say um, for um, a program who has a objective, big objective, it means how to to meet the needs with the objectives of the of the program of or the proposal. Is it clear? The second question, I'm not sure I got it properly. I okay, need assessment at local level for big projects, but I, I didn't get the the, the, the question. How to how to meet the needs uh, with uh, with the with the programs. Well, uh, I can answer them, but you also the others want to, to say something. Now, about capitalization, uh, yes, of course, you can uh, uh, make it as a part uh, of the project, uh, part like the, the last uh, action of, uh, of your set of work of uh, working packages can be capitalization of results. Like once you uh, developed uh, a project on um, uh, maybe on a small area and uh, it works out well and you tested it and it's uh, successful then you have uh, you might have a second uh, a second phase of capitalization normally to assess uh, uh, if that something works you need some time so the capitalization phase might be a second part of uh, like a second project building on the uh, success of the first one but actually uh, it can be also a, a part of a one single project. So you have uh, like the delivery of certain activities in an area, the, the, the testing that these areas are success, that these uh, actions are successful, and then you um, capitalize them also in other in other parts of the country, for example. Like I mean, it is possible uh, completely. Uh, then you need to take care of the timing because the project is uh, it can be even very long, like 36, 48 months. You, but you need to take the, the the good time to 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 each step to each step. But definitely uh, under the interreg program, uh, there are also specific activities uh, related only to capitalization. So there are only they only fund projects that want to capitalize the good practices developed with previous projects. So this is quite uh, unique, uh, it's very specific and it's only, as far as I know, it's uh, only in that program, but I might be wrong. There are more than 500 programs in the EU. Mm, concerning the other question, I, I, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, you need to do, what you need to do is to uh, provide the, the needs assessment of the communities you work, you work with, you work on. And, but at the same time, your project needs to cope with the, the objectives of the project. But uh, normally, when a call is launched, uh, is launched uh, in function of an actual problem that is uh, highlighted, that is recognized by the donor in that area. So normally, the, the two things tend to, to go together. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not really not sure if I have understood your question properly. 
Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Um, it's a clear. That's the the point. It means um, have to meet the needs uh, exactly with uh, with the pro with the programs. Uh, um, it is big level and uh, low level. It's you know, yeah. micro level yeah. and uh, low level. That's the the question. Yeah, you understand very well what uh, what is your target. Because you might uh, you might wish to address a very specific uh, community or set of communities, and then you can um, and you can produce very specific results and meet very specific needs, and then uh, you can contribute to improve the life uh, of uh, the communities wider. But then it's going to be less specific and it's more in the overall objectives. I mean, you can't solve everything. You need to be very, very specific um, on what you want to do. But we can talk more um, thoroughly with uh, with examples in a, in another moment if you want. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think there is no no more question. So I would like to thank you all for uh, uh, attending uh, this this, uh, this webinar and thank you all to the speakers. Uh, your intervention. I hope you enjoy it. I wish you to have a nice uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank, bye -bye. You. thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.